On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, we go one more time into the vault to look at Thomas Leonard's 101 coaching mistakes to avoid. Today, we're going to look at numbers 71 through 80. So with no further ado, let's dig in. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Welcome once again to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, looking at the 101 Coaching Mistakes to Avoid by Thomas Leonard. Today, we're going to be looking at mistakes number 71 through 80. So with no further ado, number 71, Thomas Leonard writes, complicating your client's life. That's mistake number 71, complicating your client's life. He writes, you know strategies and systems that will ultimately help a client's effectiveness and happiness, but the time slash space it takes to learn and install such things may not be what the client wants or needs right now, given the learning curve. He says, look for the simple doable, yeah, there's a hyphen there, doable, doable solutions to pressing and time sensitive problems instead of trying to help the client make wholesale changes when they don't have the room or need for those right now. Now, of course, this is a, a judgment call on your part, um, but it's, it's, it, it speaks to a, a situation that I've seen a lot. People sometimes go into coaching with a system, you know, that I've got a coaching program I'm going to put you through and everybody goes through the same kind of coaching program. And of course, we know that the best coaches tailor things to the individual needs of their client, of this particular person. And this is a really good mistake to avoid. What I try to do when I feel like there's something that they really need to do, and I was faced this with just yesterday as an example. Um, I was looking in the four quadrants of, you know, highly effective people, Stephen Covey's work. And my client had like, you know, I'm exaggerating for effect. He had like 25 things in the quadrant two thing. And he says, I'm doing most of all of those things every day. I just, I'm not doing some other ones. Um, that were within the quadrant. So the other quadrants were wonderful, mostly empty. Quadrants four was completely empty. Quadrant three was maybe one or two things in there. And quadrant one had, you know, one or two things in there, but pretty good. Um, And for what he wants to do with his business, there were some other things he needs to do. And getting some of those quadrant two things done that aren't being done yet, are part of that. To do that, he really needs to kind of redesign his whole business, um, which is a challenge, you know, and it's a big undertaking. So, you know, I'm not going to just say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to just dismantle your business and start over. You know, you can't, yeah, can't do that. And um, so what I told him about was the Michael Gerber book, the the E-Myth, And I kind of summarized the book for him in, you know, four minutes. I think I've told you about that. I think I did this on this podcast where, you know, you say, hey, you know, you have to work on the business side, in the business, you need systems, you, you as an entrepreneur, that's what E-Myth stands for, is the entrepreneurial myth. You know, what an entrepreneur really does is design systems that other people can then carry out. So it's like that. I I often do that If if I know how to, with a particular book, I I will present a, you know, a five minute summary or four minute summary of the major points of that book. So the people get what they need to do, you know, step at a time. So you don't want to complicate their life. Your job is to make it as simple as possible. By working with you, they should say, oh, I've got all these um, plates spinning in the air, but now I have fewer plates spinning in the air and I'm, I'm being much more effective with my plate spinning. Instead of saying, hey, here's some more plates. Let's see if we can get these spinning too. No, you want to take the plates away. Coaching mistake number 72, being someone other than a coach. Now, this is kind of an interesting one. And perhaps if he was writing them to this today, it would not be 
written in the same way. Maybe it'd be a, a, a similar point, but worded differently because back when Thomas was writing this, he was kind of already still in the process of inventing the industry. Coaching didn't really exist. You know, life coaching wasn't a career choice. Um, you know, we had little league coaches, football coaches, baseball coaches, you know, we had that sort of stuff. And some people made allusions to being a coach. Tony Robbins used to say that he was not really a therapist. I'm really a coach, but he's doing therapies and, you know, called it that at the time. So these days, many people are therapists who call themselves coaches. So this isn't going to be exactly as pertinent today as it was back then, because there is, you know, a perhaps greater definition of what a coach is today than it used to be. That being said, it is also really important to recognize that there are boundaries, very important boundaries. So I'm going to read what Thomas Leonard wrote, and then you can take it from there. He says, unless the coaching relationship has been well-defined, it's easy to slip into other familiar roles, like, here's a list, best friend, brother slash sister, parent, consultant, counselor, financial advisor, lawyer, business partner. Now, obviously, I hope it's obvious, you're not going to be a you know, offering legal advice or financial advice to your client. But, you know, counselor, maybe you will. And whatever the role is, it should be clearly defined. And what you have sort of agreed to do with your coach client is what you do with your coach client and, and you stay out of there. It's it's really easy to slip out of that if you don't have these really uh, clearly defined goals and and have the, the discipline on your, and yourself to stay within them. I, I'm friendly with my coach clients, very friendly, but we're not friends. They're my clients and I'm their coach and there's a difference, right? So stick to that. Coaching mistake number 73, stepping over stuff that doesn't ring true. When you're listening to your client and they say stuff that you go like, oh, I'm not sure if that's exactly, what, what do you say there? What'd you say there? Um, don't let it go. I'll read to you what Thomas says, and then I'll come back to what I was just about to say. He says, if it doesn't ring true for you, ask client to clarify what they're saying or trying to say. Your opinion slash reactions count. There is a key way. This is a key way to create value for the client. Interrupt if necessary. Press for what is true until you are satisfied or until the client can't or won't go any further. Remember, coaching is a partnership, not just a professional listening or cheerleading service. Yeah, it's not just a professional listening or cheer. You know, it's in the old days, talking about coaching versus therapy, there, there was a listening sort of type of therapy where you just go and listen. You know, oh, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, wow. How do you feel about that? You know, the kind of therapy that people would just talk therapy. Um of course, that doesn't give it a full service. It's more than that. But there is a lot of that. We're just really good listening. And there's value to that, no doubt. There is great value in, in being a good listener uh, and really, you know, helping them to formulate things that uh, maybe they hadn't been able to otherwise. That's for sure. And when they say things within all that stuff that they're saying that doesn't quite sit for you then you go like what wait then your job is to ask questions we've talked i think i have a whole episode on question asking maybe a couple at this point um you must ask good questions you must ask good questions penetrating to get to where what they actually mean and sometimes they're stepping over because they don't want to really face that so what your job is then is to ask those tough questions that nobody else is really asking. So mistake number 73 is stepping over stuff that doesn't ring true. Mistake number 74 is creating a dependency. This one is one of my pet peeves about coaching. I've seen this in, in, in many coaches before, um, creating a dependency. Thomas Leonard writes this. He writes, coaches created a dependency by doing too much for clients, like too much support, reminders, structure, or getting too close to clients emotionally. You've crossed the line when the client's goal or problem has become yours. 
continually challenge and support the clients to create their own support structures, network, community, partnerships, et cetera, so that coaching can remain clean, independent, and empowering. He also writes, note, some clients like being dependent. Careful. Thus spaketh Thomas. He writes, careful. So, yeah, be careful. Because people sometimes want to be told what to do. You know, I've seen this so often in coaches. Like, I have the answers. I am the expert. Follow me and I will tell you what to do. That is just wrong, I think. You know, there are times when, yeah, you you maybe will be direct like that, but not often. Usually what you're doing is asking questions and helping them to figure things out on their own. You should create an independency, ultimately. Yes, I have, I think, two coaches that have been with me for more than a year. And of all the coaches that I've coached, that's a real rarity. Most of my coaching clients are with me for three to six months. And then they say, wow, this has been great. Thank you. I am so much better than I ever thought it could be. And wow, this has been, you know, and then they're spreading their wings and flying. They are independent. They've learned, you know, these things. They've grown by themselves because we've co-created, not because I'm so great, but because they've figured it out on their own with some guidance, obviously, from me. You want to create an independence. You want your clients to discover how they can do this for themselves, not to create a dependency. And that leads directly, I believe, into coaching mistake number 75 is you created, want to have them be dependent on you because they are a source of income. So mistake number 75 is looking at clients as revenue sources. Thomas writes, clients do bring you revenue. But if you slip into seeing them as a check, they will sense this and will likely opt out of coaching with you. Coaching is a calling, even more than a business. And if you slip into the business side too much, you might temporarily increase your revenues, but ultimately they will drop. Coaching is a relationship. The revenue stream is a byproduct of that relationship. Coaching is a coaching relationship. As I said before, be careful of boundaries, but it is a coaching relationship. It's a calling. You are there as a the servant master kind of thing. I think that's an expression I got from somewhere. Um, remember Becky Robbins using that expression a lot. You know, to, you are a master of your craft. You've been working hard. You know how to do coaching. You are expert in many things. And you are there to serve. You are there to, to help, to guide, to, to encourage, to you know, be a, a tough love person and, you know, tell them things that nobody else is willing to tell them, you know, being that, that kind of hard edge thing. When necessary, you read your client and be what they need, but they are not, a, they are, but they are not only a revenue source, right? It is your business. Obviously, it is kind of enhanced, what's the word? Uh, enlightened self-interest. You know, you're a people helper. That's what you do. And yet, you know, you just can't look at them that way. Because when you do, when you have that need, and by the way, I've been there, we've all been there from time to time where, you know, business hasn't been so good and you need some clients and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you just got to sort of, in a way, give it away, give your best stuff and, you know, it will work out. Coaching mistake number 76, not walking your own talk. This reminds me of a story. I've probably told you the story. If I haven't told you, you know it, I'm sure, probably from somewhere. Um, it's a famous story. I doubt it's actually true, but it's a good story. My, maybe there is truth to it somewhere in there. But it involves um, Hatma Gandhi. And apparently there is a, a young boy who is a, a, a big fan of his, as everyone was, of course, back in India in those days. But um, his mother thought the boy was eating too much sugar. And so she took him to Mahatma Gandhi to get help with that. So um, she went to an you know, arduous journey across India on trains and things. But she finally got this audience with, with, with Gandhi. And, and she says, I'd like you to tell my son to quit eating sugar. So Mahatma Gandhi says, OK, um, come back in two weeks and walks out of the room. And she's like, <laughs> dumbfounded, but what are you going to do? So uh, she leaves and makes the arduous journey back across India. And then two weeks later, once again, returns 
and has another audience with Mahatma Gandhi. And he looks at the boy and says, quit eating sugar and gets up to leave. And she says, hold on there, Mahatma. Oh, just hold your horses. What? 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 You, you couldn't have done that two weeks ago? That's it? You couldn't have done that two weeks ago? And Gandhi says, um, no, because two weeks ago, I was eating too much sugar or sugar at all. So it's an interesting thing, not walking your own talk. You must live up to what you tell other people to do. You're coaching. I'll read what Thomas Lennon says because he agrees with me. Tom, Tom and I, you know, totally. Um, so here's, here's what he says. Listen to him. He says, your coaching is more effective when you walk your own talk. Otherwise, something will be off. It's like getting somebody to quit smoking if you're smoking a pack a day. It's like it's really, maybe you know the techniques, but you will be vastly more effective as a non-smoker to help other people quit smoking. Thomas continues. Coaches often attract clients who are ready to go to the level the coach recently reached in whatever area. So to get more slash better clients, take yourself to the next level in knowledge, living, evolution, skill sets, and professional development. That said, however, it is okay to ask clients to do more than you would be willing to do. Why hold your clients to your level of performance? So, uh, yeah, as an example, I um, have told clients that they should make their bed every morning. I make my bed every morning. I do. Uh, I, I exercise every day without fail, sometimes more than others. You, you see my ease process involved, but every day. Uh, I get up every morning at six o'clock. I, I, I acquired this um, this light bulb. I don't know if I told you about this, but there's a, um, I, I, I don't like alarm clocks. I don't like to have that jolting <laughs> thing in the morning. So um, <laughs> I'm really good at waking up early in the summertime when like the sun is coming up around 5.15 or whatever. And by six o'clock, it's pretty bright out. And, you know, I, I get up. Not too hard. Hard around, you know, I'm recording this in December and, and uh, it's the Northeast. So yeah, it's dark at six o'clock in the morning. So I bought this, this Wi-Fi light bulb. You can find it. I, I looked hard to find a, a, an alarm clock that had this feature, but, but they were very expensive and unwieldy. And I tried a few, but they didn't work right. And um, so I found this really simple Wi-Fi light bulb and it hooks up to an app on my phone. And you can set it, you know, so your phone talks to it through the Wi-Fi system. And and um, and you set it to come on at a certain time. So I've and then it gets gradually brighter for like an hour. So it's got this sunrise feature kind of thing. So I set it for 545, just come on very dimly, 545. And it's in, you know, the next room over. So I have to, you know, don't see it directly in the bedroom. And then uh, it gradually gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. So by 6.15, it's on full. So somewhere between 6 and, you know, somewhere in that vicinity, I go like, oh, time to get up. And I do. Nine times out of 10, nine, 99 times out of 100. Um, there are times when, you know, it's up late doing a podcast or something that I might not get right, right away. But, you know, pretty much up. And then pretty much out and doing exercise, you know, by seven ish or something like that, six thirty, six forty five. I have a client who um a coach client who has asked me to hold him accountable to being at the gym every morning at five fifty. He gets up at five. So I said I would hold him accountable by having him show send me a photo uh from the treadmill you know at five fifty. I'm not getting up at 5.50 to check his, you know, his text. I'm not getting up at 5, certainly say, are you up yet? I'm not doing that. But, you know, sure, you, that's what you want to do, then by all means, I'll, I'll do my part, hold you accountable to that. So, yeah, God bless him and good for him. So walk your own talk. And by the way, this also is kind of the thing where I've said before, coaches should have coaches. That's another thing as well. If you think that people that you're talking to ought to have a coach, i.e. you, then maybe you should have a coach too. I have one. You'll notice, you know, the best athletes in the world have coaches. So uh, think about it. 
Coaching mistake number 77, raising fees before you are ready to. It is important to charge the fees that you are comfortable with, that you feel good about. Don't raise fees just to raise fees or because other coaches charge more or less than you do. There is a fee that you feel you are worth and that your clients confirm. Raise fees when your practice develops a waiting list or when you start coaching clients to get more value when they pay higher fees. Uh, what was that last part? Or when you co- Oh, when you start coaching clients, when you start coaching clients, I get it. When you start coaching clients who get more value when they pay higher fees. I wish I'd read that right the first time because I know that sentiment. It absolutely people do. Tony Robbins used to talk about how in his first firewalk he like did it for free and nobody came. So he charged 25 bucks and he got 25 people. Started charging more money, you get more people. Charges a lot of money now, it gets a lot of people. I don't think that's the only reason. And nevertheless, they've done studies, I'm sure you are aware of this, where they've taken um, bottles of wine and given taste tests to people, say these are you know three different $20 bottles of wine. And then oh, over here, there's three $100 bottles of wine. And uh, let's, let's rank these six bottles. And the you know, $100 bottles are always better. And yet... Later, it's revealed they are all the same wine. They've been just poured into different bottles from the same cask. But people actually experience the the $100 bottles as being better. It's not just like, well, I think it's better. They, They taste it as better. So sometimes when you charge a higher rate for things, people experience more value. So it's good to charge as much as you can and not too much and finding that sweet spot is what this is mistake is all about don't raise your fees until you're ready to do so and when you are do so raise them sometimes that's hard it was for me to raise my rates for sure many many years people would tell me i was charging way too little money but it was comfortable for me it was what i felt right so as i've raised my rates and i've I've seen this nobody's balked at it you know people just pay it you know, because it's good. It's it's the service that's worth it. You know, it's a dollar return, you know, it's 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 a it's a worthwhile investment, and that's obviously what's most important. Coaching mistake number 78. Coaching yourself vicariously. This is an interesting one. Coaching yourself vicariously. Thomas writes, everything you are saying to a client, you're also telling or reminding yourself. This is normal. But when your needs, life problems and goals are large, the risk is that you coach your clients as if they were you. Your stuff leaks into coaching. From time to time, verify with your clients that they feel coached about their lives, not yours. And, oh, here, look at what he says here. Have a coach of your own to work this stuff out with when it occurs. Have a coach of your own to work this stuff out with when it occurs. So, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? People do this sometimes. I mean, I learn a lot from my clients. Don't get me wrong. I learn a lot and I you know, hear myself telling them things that it's like, oh, right. Yeah, I need to do that. <laughs> like make your bed in the morning or exercise at six or whatever it might be, you know, true, 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 true. And sometimes like you'll notice that a lot of the things you're saying is like, this is what I think for me. And what, but what? is that that they need what is it that they need always be aware of that and 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 start off uh, Stephen Gilligan and Robert Diltz have this this thing they call the coach state c-o-a-c-h coach state Um, we've talked about it before I've told you what that means I don't have it up off the tip of my fingers Um, but it basically it means that you enter into the coach state you're not multitasking, you, you're focusing on your client, you're you're settling down in your chair, you are feeling centered and open and you're listening and you're paying attention. All of your attention is on them listening. And as Thomas Leonard said, a lot of times the, the coaching happens in the last seven minutes of the session, but your information gathering, you're, you're taking this in. So when you do that, you're not going to coach yourself vicariously but sometimes we get so caught up in what we're doing it's like okay here's what you need to do and we coach ourselves vicariously the client so be careful of that 
That's all I'll say about that. Coaching mistake number 79 is not learning from your client. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Not learning from your client. It's a mistake to not learn from your client. If you're too busy coaching, you're not going to be learning very much from your clients. Make the choice to learn cool stuff from clients, how they think, their success models, what limits the client, blocks to success, technical skills, internet skills, current business thinking, demographic trends. The trick is to be interested, not just interesting. I think there's something kind of magic that a client feels when you are, number one, totally fascinated by their opinions, their ideas, their thoughts, their, 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 their ventures, you know, you, you find it really interesting. And that when they feel like they've been able to sort of give back to you, to teach something to you, I've learned a lot from my clients, really, honestly, a lot. Of course, that's not the point. You know, we are there to serve them, but it is kind of curious how we learn a lot and it's valuable for them, for us to learn from them as well. So let go of, I must be the expert all the time, right? Let go of the feeling that you must be the expert all the time. You must be the guy in, or the woman in the higher rank position and you're, you know, bestowing upon these minions down here, the knowledge and the wisdom of your ages, you know, forget it. This is a partnership. You are equal partners. You're on the same playing field, right? And you're co-creating as coach Dave Buck says, where we're playing together. This is it's what coaching is coming from. It comes from sports and games. Let's play. Hey, let's play. So you're both doing this, right? Both doing this. So learn from your clients. It's okay. And in fact, it's recommended. It would be a mistake not to. In fact, it's mistake number 79. Mistake number 80, last one for today, is talking people into coaching. This one harkens back to the one that says, uh, uh, looking at clients as revenue sources. Don't talk somebody into coaching. Offer the option. Offer this amazing thing that you do for people. Let them know what it is. And so here's what Thomas writes. He says, better that the client buy coaching from you than you trying to sell coaching to potential clients. Rather than try to sell a person on the value of coaching, try one of the following instead. Sell the client on themselves, their dreams, vision, etc. Coach the client on the spot so they experience it. Share a fitting, exciting business idea so they would have a compelling reason to want to work with a coach. Ask the client a question that gets them to want significantly more of that from you and for their life, thus creating a gap. I have often given away entire sessions, call them discovery sessions. Sometimes they're a couple hours long where I really, I'm there to serve. I, I, I'm there to expose them and say, yeah, well, this is by the way, what we can do and we can do more of this. I don't shy away from saying that, but it's not what it's about. And, you know, what's curious about that is the more I feel like I want this client, you know, revenue source or whatever, the less it's likely to happen. The more I can just say to myself and, you know, to be in that coaching state and be open and just really focusing on the client, the much, much more likely it is that they will say, wow, this has been great. How do I do more of this? I want to be a a client of yours. Let's do some coaching together. Much more. I mean, like, it's almost like night and day. So that would be coaching mistake number 80, trying to talk people in to coaching. So that is it for today. That is 71 through 80. And I have to tell you, I'm I'm getting a little sad here in anticipation of not having any more of these to share with you. There's only 21 more to go of the 101 ways. We'll go 81 to 90 next week and then 90 to 101 the following week or next time after that i'm not sure you know weeks per se but the next uh, installment of these aren't these great boy it really always just reminds me what a what a a gift thomas leonard gave to us all by creating this this business this world of coaching and uh, you know the amazing stuff he offered and um what a what a 
sad thing that he lost him so early, but what an amazing, you know, amount of work and stuff he left us while he was here. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Hope this has been valuable for you as it is for me. And gosh, I look forward to seeing you again. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks.